My name is Dr. Byron Cole. I am a serial award-winning entrepreneur, Sunday Times best-selling author, and I help startups get to six and seven figures. First of all, I love teaching people. Like, do this, 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 get that result. That's what I love, mentoring. Would you advise someone who's building businesses to buy a house to live in or to rent? Oh, this is really, really interesting. I had to beg him, my own <laughs> friend, to invest in this business. My car got stolen from my driveway. Yeah. I rang the police. He goes, oh, well, we're not going to bother to come because, you know, there's no car there. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> right? Just rubbing it in. <laughs> when things go wrong, that's when we really come alive. That's when it's game time. Max. Travel the world together, beach clubs, parties, great dinners. We live like rock stars. Uh, this is the first time publicly I'm actually speaking about it. I've never spoke about it before. So as usual, we've done a whole pod before the pod. Yes. It happens yeah. a lot. <laughs> we do this <laughs> every time and then we say yeah, we shouldn't yeah, do this yeah. next time. Yeah. <laughs> just as an overview then, uh, Byron, yes. just for the listeners, who are you and what do you do? How long have I got? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so my name is Dr. Byron Cole. I am a serial award-winning entrepreneur, Sunday Times best-selling author, and I help startups get to six and seven figures. And I help people use their voice on stage to generate revenue. So there are many founders and business owners that have a great voice, great story, great experiences. And there are organizations that are paying for your knowledge, your experience and your journeys. So I help you become paid professional speakers like I've done with many of our mentees and like I work very closely with my business partner and wife. Uh, and that's the short version of a long story. Nice. And, and so how's your how's your time split between your different avenues? Where's your main focus? Yeah, I always find that a really interesting question. Why must there be a main focus? Perhaps it doesn't. Yeah. Have you got a main focus? Yeah. Um, so my flagship program for 2025 is the Speakers Academy. So that is helping people become professional speakers. Um, but we dip into all different... I'm writing a new, another book now. I've got two more books that need to come out. So they just... Thankfully, I have an absolutely incredible team who I drive crazy with all of my ideas, all of my changes, and so on and so forth. But... Um, I would say that would be my my main, if we had to say, if I have a main focus for next year, that's what it will be. So we're just doing it. We're doing a monthly session at the moment, once a month, every month for the rest of this year. Mm -hmm. And next year, it will be my main because then I'll have ads running to it and everything else. We're just doing mostly organic now, uh, but I've got ads starting actually at the end of this month. So we'll see how that He's goes. in person. Yeah, in person, two-day training with me and Bianca and my team teaching everything from crafting your script to selling on stage to um, negotiating the deals, how much you should be charging, so on and so forth, how to get a TED talk, all that kind of stuff. Why, so, why, um, why are you passionate about that? So I've been rewind. mentoring now for the last five years, helping business owners create six, seven figures and above. And that's been absolutely incredible. And it's naturally coming to its end. I've enjoyed my time doing that. Uh, and this is just a different model now where we're able to help more people on more of a one-to-many basis. And it's very, it's very, with the business mentoring, it's so varied. It's like, tell me a problem, I'll give you the solution. Whereas this is very clear. Everyone can get on at the same time and follow the process and get the same results. Whereas business, the mentoring is so varied. You're going to have a different problem. You're going to have a different problem. You need marketing. You need branding. You need something else. So everyone's so different. So this is becoming uh, a much more easier vehicle to scale. Uh, and we've been doing it in our last 18 months. And we're seeing like, we're like, oh, we know this was the plan. But we're actually seeing you get over and beyond what we expected for a newbie speaker. People getting paid 10K for 15 minutes of their time whilst on holiday with their kids. That's mad. Right. So, and it's just a lot, it's a growing market as well. The webinar market is a growing market. You guys, we were talking about webinars and stuff like that. And it's all the same thing, being able to tell a story, being able to share your knowledge. And then if you shall choose, you can sell on the end, provide the value, and then you can sell something to the audience if they want to buy it, right? So this is what, it's becoming our main program. Um, my wife, uh, business partner, she's been speaking on stages now for the last 12 years. Uh, I've been negotiating many deals for her over the years from all the FTSE 100 brands, Accenture, PwC, EY, Barclays, all these massive brands, Google, Facebook, 
um, we've been doing deals with to speak on stage and sometimes they're just brand partnership deals like with Fiverr so if you go on Fiverr's YouTube right now you'll see us on there see her on there as they ask where you'll see her on there for the de uh, deal that I negotiated where they want one thing but they don't quite know what they want so you give them something slightly different and it's a fantastic partnership and there's all these opportunities out there we've all used Fiverr before recommended Fiverr as business owners right um, they have a budget for marketing how can we help them you know, mm. as simple as that so um, we started Bianca's last business off the back of that and um, incredible journey. So yeah, so that's going to be the main program now for next so you've, year. You've mentored, mentored a lot of people to six, seven figure businesses, right? Like what was your first six and seven figure business? Oh, my first business I exited was a property services business. So property. Uh, so we were doing the EPCs, the floor plans, the photography, periodic inspections, the gas certificates. We were doing all that fun stuff. So when my first business that failed was an estate agency and I was like, okay, what am I going to do? How, how, sorry, to yeah. how did that fail? Yeah, so I, I invested in this bit. So to take it back, I was um, brokering property deals when I was in university. Um, this is like before, it's a different, it was a different market, right? Um, mortgages were easier to get into, to get for clients. So, so I was kind of packaging and brokering these deals, right? For my clients, getting them um, discounted properties, finding people that want to get into the way. We were doing gifted deposits. We were doing all kinds of things. People were getting into the market quite easily, to be perfectly honest. So I had this disposable income and then a client of mine said, oh, um, would you be interested in an estate agency? Of course. I love property. Like, I'm like the property guy. I'm in university. I think I'm the man. So I gave her all my money and I was like, yeah, I'm in. And... Uh, I didn't qualify my purchase. You know, she was great at what she'd done and she's she's incredible at what she does. Um, but I just didn't ask the right questions. Uh, and I didn't know how to qualify my purchase. As a result of that, the company had some debt that I wasn't aware of. Like, she had a smaller business and was moving. She needed my capital, really, to start the new location. So I just wasn't aware of lots of things. And as a result of that, uh, along with the credit crunch. So I'm not blaming that, but there was multiple. So me, I wasn't able to qualify it. I didn't, and that mean, not being able to qualify it meant I didn't understand what I was buying. Um, and then the credit crunch happened 2008. And that was the nail in the coffin, whereby it wasn't like how the credit crunch, uh, the, the pandemic was. The pandemic came and they pumped trillions, billions into the economy. You can have money, you can have money, you can have money. Everyone got money from the pandemic. Bounce back loans, it was insane, right? The, if you guys are familiar with the uh, credit crunch when it was 2008, every single mortgage deal that I had on the table, every single offer I had on the table was pulled by every lender. It was a bloodbath. Mm. Can you imagine that overnight? Your whole lead flow, done. That is insane. So I just remember that happening. And I'm like, what are we going to do? Like, we can't complete. Deals in the pipeline. All that projected revenue. Like, next week you're projected to close on four deals, five deals. That's gone. That's mad, isn't That's it? Like, like, what you're kind like, of position did that put you in from successful business to, you know, that I position? I wouldn't say there. it was ever a successful business. It was just transacting, Right. I was never really making any money. I was getting pocket money, you know, to just keep me going. But the thing that I was doing is I was connecting with some incredible people. You know, we always talk about the art of networking. I didn't know I was doing these things at the time. Even now, um, there's a client that's not too far from here, actually. And he, uh, we were doing mortgages with him and he's our friend. And all these people that uh, I was doing business with, they are still in my life. From brokers, solicitors, solicitor, one of the solicitors in this book, he sponsored part of it. So, like, all these relationships that I was building, I didn't know I was building them, but it's worked out incredible later on. So, okay, it doesn't pay you at the time, but you're learning so much. And I had clients that would, like, just pick me up and take me to their sites. And I'm like, I didn't even really think about it. They're just taking me. I'm just jumping in the car. Now, when I've met some of these people, um, they're bringing their children to my events, and their children are like, just finishing university i'm like well, it's crazy so i would jump in the car with their kids right and i like, would go to these sites so i was learning so much so the impact that it had on me wasn't like 
so detrimental that it wiped me out, right? Because I wasn't really making anything at the time. So when it did happen, it was like the business was going to have major impact. I remember I had had my property still, so I still needed money, my cars, and I still had bills, right? Um, so that was really interesting. And then I said, well, what's the main problem that I had at the, at, as an estate agent? One of them was that I had to wait on site for so long for services to be completed. So, you know, we need floor plans, photography, gas certificates, whatever it is to sell the property or rent the property out, right? So I said, I want to be a one-stop shop. I'm going to provide all these services. And then I read the manifesto, government manifesto. I know it sounds really bored and really weird, right? But if you read the manifesto, right, it tells you what they're, they're planning. For a business owner, this is gold. Mm. So they said in the manifesto, a government initiative for uh, uh, low carbon emissions using this particular vehicle, which is called an energy performance difficult. So I was like, what? It's going to be mandatory. And they're rolling it out and pushing it. So I became qualified as a domestic energy assessor, DEA. So I was able to produce those reports. Clever. Yeah. What would you say is the biggest lesson you learned from that first business? <sighs> Contracts are really important, even with friendships. Um, because it just outlines, uh, it just gives everybody clarity. Um, and uh, sometimes people do more than others. And it just gives you a lot of clarity and a lot of peace of mind. So contracts are really, really important. No matter who you're doing business with, friends, family or foe, like just get in clarity who's responsible for what, who's entitled to what. In the event that something goes wrong, who gets what? whether it's the furniture, whether it's the artwork, whether it's the camera, like who gets what? God forbid something happens, right? Um, so I would definitely say uh, having clarity on on who gets what, um, that was a major learning experience for me. What was it specifically that taught you that? Did you have an experience with a partner which didn't Yeah, so that well? experience meant I had to walk away with nothing. Right, so it ended up being sold to somebody else. So it was in crisis mode, right? So because I didn't have all my ducks in order, because now we're in crisis, we're trying to offload it. But I could have circumvented that kind of loss with a with a contract that said this, that, and the other. At the time, it wasn't. I was still young. I didn't really care that much anyway. But still, I could have still got something out of that deal, but I left with nothing even though it went to somebody else. But they bought the debt, they bought everything else. So really, you want them to take it anyway. Yeah. But I still could have probably negotiated. If I had um, more strength in a contract, I could have had a better deal out of it. Yeah. And then sure. so on the property services business, just uh, fast forward into, to, to that. How, uh, what was that journey like to make that into a success? Yeah, it was really cool because we were doing all these surveys and stuff like that and... Uh, just like we were doing little things that were giving, giving us great retention. You know, it's so important about, the, you know, the onboarding, the, the retention. And we just started doing things. There was two things to answer your question. Number one, we were building a really good pipeline of clients by doing some things really simple. Like, for example, you know on pack test. Have you ever had a pack mm -hmm. test yeah. where you do the test the appliance? Yeah. And we were, we were putting the stickers on. People weren't doing that 10 years ago, right? So we would put the sticker on with the expiry date of when it was and our company details. And that just meant retention was very high. So we had all this data and then we were producing the energy performance certificates. So because we were producing these reports, I was getting everyone qualified. My wife, my friends, everyone was getting qualified because I figured out how to, uh, to produce this report. It would normally take 45 minutes to an hour. I was able to produce this report in a matter of minutes, really. I know they're not going to be happy with me, but it was true. We, we, I was able to, and without failing the audit, so we was able to produce this report. So we became one of the largest holders of this document. So because of the data that we held, it was attractive to a buyer. We had all these reports and then something called the Green Deal came out. I won't bore you with it, but essentially because of the data that we held, it became attractive to a buyer and that's how I ended up selling my first company. What did you sell that for? Uh, undisclosed. Do you I can't have to sign and say Yeah, non-disclosure. Oh. Yeah. So, so when you yeah, had twice, so I sold it twice. By the way, so I had a two-year non-compete. Yeah. So then I went back into it. I built it again because it was just easy. I just knew how to do it. I knew how ads work, Google Ads, and uh, it was easy. Uh, and then I sold it again to a company in Streatham. Again, non-disclosure, but that's easily Googleable. Was yeah. that like the first time you came into good amounts of money? And if so, how did it change your life? Did you start getting bust down watches? Or were you more <laughs> sensible? <laughs> uh, 
uh, we live in the UK. You know, if you wear a bust down watch, you, you might leave without a hand or an arm. <laughs> you know, so uh, <laughs> um, to answer the question, did it change my life? No, not really. You know, you buy, you set up your family. You don't want certain people to work anymore. You, you know, but you go again. You're still young. You don't need money. How old were you when you exited that business? <sighs> Twenty, late twenties. Okay, nice. Yeah, like Have you exited businesses since? Um, yeah, on a micro level, but nothing crazy. Um, but I've got one that's coming up. I think that's going to be crazy. Um, it is a. Uh, I know I always get hold off for saying numbers and stuff, so let me be careful. My uh, the founder. So, what can I share? So my my uh, found one of my friends. He is a. How do I describe it? You know, payment authentication. Mm -hmm. You know, when you get the payment authentication on your phone, you have to authorize. He created that, or created a software version of that, and sold it to Stripe. Okay. So uh, they were acquired by Stripe. You can Google it. It's not difficult. Uh, and then, how do I say it? Because I know he's got some NDAs. Um, he has now started the business again. Okay. They've had a separation. Let's call it that. And now he's starting the business again by himself and gave me the opportunity. Well, let me rephrase that and I hope he's watching this. I had to beg him, <laughs> my own friend, right? To invest in this business so he sold it to stripe multi-millionaire richer than all of us and um tech genius he's like kanye of the tech world that's how i describe him right uh crazy genius right but he understands the landscape and just sees things in a different way right and um and when he was like looking for investment for this uh new um project or the same project again because he had to rebuild the tech i was like yeah, I'm in. Like, he's like, Byron, you've got nothing to offer me other than money. I'm like, what? <laughs> My own friend, you know? So you've worked with a lot of business owners over yeah. the years, yeah. right? Helping them get to six figures, seven figures. What would you say is one of the biggest problems that business owners find it hard to overcome? Yeah. What would you say that is and why? Oh, great question. So first of all, we all struggle with staffing across the board. Facts. Tell no, me about it. Right? <laughs> no matter no matter where you are, no matter how low you are or how high you are, I just spoke to one of my friends. He's like, a, he's doing incredibly well. Um, and he's like, we hold each other accountable for various things. We share ideas, blah, blah, blah. He rang me. He's like, listen, my salesperson drives me crazy. Blah, 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 blah. Like, and he's on a high level, you know? And it's like, no matter where you are on this journey, staffing. Hardest thing. And I don't even think there's a solution, right? <laughs> <laughs> You gotta get enough of them in the door and uh, keep training. The keep, the, keep the good ones. Once I know they say when they when you know they're bad, get rid of them fast, right? But it's all well and good saying that, but it's not practical. I don't find sometimes because you still need to do some of that work. But I have found every time I've left, I've let someone go, or they've left or resigned, and I'm like, oh, it's a bit of pain in the ass. I've always found someone better every time. Every single time, find someone better. So you're like, Shh, if I did this first time round, you know, because you know more great. what you're looking for. Perhaps I don't know what it is, but it's just <clears> interesting. <throat> you go for a bit of pain retraining a lot sometimes. Mm. Uh, so staffing across the board is a is a problem for everybody, and customer acquisition is always a problem for everybody. Everybody needs more customers, no matter who you are, right? And it's just different levels and different price. Points. How do you find the limited? limiting beliefs of a lot of yeah. I guess people earlier on in their journey yeah do you know what I find that I find um, I use a goal setting process to, to map out how I achieve things and I can share some of those with you but um, I live in a world where I can have and do and be whatever I want Like literally I'm not even like saying it arrogantly like li I can do whatever I want with this process but also it's like when I Look at, I used to think like footballers earn a lot of money and stuff. Like that. It's like when you look at the stats, 40% of Premier League footballers go bust. Anyway, <laughs> it's funny you just right, say yeah. that. We just had a podcast oh, really? with uh, Joel and he's uh, 
So oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and he's uh, I mean, he said the exact same fact. He's in a football. He's, he's a, a football, football presenter. Oh, there you go. Yeah, right. yeah. So you know, I'm not Chang. And he rubbish. said, he said, I need to make sure I get a stat right. He said, I think it's forty percent. And yeah, forty percent. <laughs> right. uh, so like, imagine you all this, and your career is short as well, right? But I used to think sometimes that amount of money's like back in my day, twenty grand a week. You like that's crazy. Like that's. But now I'm just like. Like turning down some deals at that level, and like, yeah, it's too much stress. Mm. I've got a client right now that wants to do a project with us, and I'm just like, ah, you're going to be hard work. But I know her, she's cool, but I know that's going to be hard work. So I'm just like deferring it as much as I can. I don't want to do the deal, right? But like, the limiting beliefs is only because it's their limitation, I feel like, and they're just not around the right people. And people think, oh, you're being like, this is, I'm seeing people do this. Like, um, I wouldn't call him a mentor, but I went on a training program, someone who I respect and rate very highly. He's my unofficial mentor, as I would call it. I went on his four-day training program. He does the Speakers Academy like we do. Um, I was in the room for four days. He did f- about 600 grand's worth of business for four days. Wow. So he has an entry-level product, which was <laughs> like 23 grand, and it goes up to like 35 grand, something like that, right? And we all paid two grand to be in the room, Right? He did like 600 grand in four days. And people were like, you know, that's not possible. He did three quarters of a million pounds in four days. That's mad. Like, was he one of the people that spoke at uh, EMC? Or not? Maybe not last year, but maybe this year. I think he was there this year. What's his name? Is it Alan Harringo? Andy Harrington. Andy Harrington. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. it, yeah. Andy Harrington. Everyone speaks. G. Everyone speaks. Yeah. Yeah. Very, Absolute very highly, yeah. G. Yeah, we see him right? do a talk there. Absolute G. And he, he did the speaking talk. Uh, yeah. He was good, and he went through. Yeah. But his whole thing, it was mad because the whole he was teaching us how to make content, yeah. like how to make a video advert. Yeah. But the whole thing is a pitch. It's a pitch, but it's, but it's so yeah. clever. Oh, that, was, that was yeah. genius. Yeah, it was so clever. It was like um, we NLP. were with our NLP coach at the time. He was yeah. with us, a guy called Steve Duran, and Steve yeah. said, "This guy is an yeah. NLP expert. He's an expert. Yeah, yeah, he so. uses all of the tricks, genius. and I love it. Yeah, and <laughs> and and he delivers good quality training." So when he's positioning his offer at the end, and I think the cheapest package is like 15 grand, but they, they don't want to sell that. They don't want to sell that. You wanna, they don't, they're not selling it to you, right? So everybody else, and they're doing like 55% close. You can do the maps. <laughs> they're closing 55% of people, you know? Mad. So they're doing four days and earning three quarters of a million pounds, right? So when people say, oh, that's a lot of, like, it's not. Like I'm doing six figures for two days. Right, so I'm, um, but I, I'm not, I'm single digit, six figures. I need to get to, to where he is at the high, li- the high single digits, mm. like or high, high, high digits. Like I need to get there, so I know that there's where I am, which starts with a one, six figures, and where he is starts with a six. So like, there's a massive gap. What would you say your why is? Like, what are you chasing now? Because you got yeah. the house with the pool. Yeah. What What's next for you? Like in terms of why are you doing this? Yeah. Do you know what? Yeah. First of all, I love teaching people an outcome that I can literally see the results of. I love that. Like do this, 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 get that result. That's what I love mentoring. Right. I also love that you can remunerate me for my results that I give you. Yeah. I like to earn income. Right. There's not a, not going to be like, oh, I just did it for the love of it. I love the, the, the collaboration of, I get to work with somebody that I like. We connect. I get to know you. I get to know your, uh, what you're about. I can show you how to do something. I'm not coach. I'm not giving you airy-fairy stuff. I'm not, no disrespect to coaches or anything. I'm telling you, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, and you get the outcome and result. And I just love that. And I'm building an incredible community of entrepreneurs and people that I do business with. Because what ends up happening is we we share ideas or I show you how to do something. You get the results, you make more money. And you're like, Byron, yeah, cool. We got, uh, you know, half a million pounds, three quarters of a million pounds. Let's do a project. Let's do a JV. Let's do this. I've got, And we end up doing other projects together. And it's just a whole ecosystem. So um, I still do it because I still, I like to, uh, I like to help people. I like to be remunerated. And then it's like, it's just like the next chase. Mm. <clears throat> He's doing three quarters of a million pounds. I want to do that. Like, I'm good enough. You know what I mean? Like, he's a G. He's an NLPG. He's, he's a great trainer. He's a great speaker. But equally, I'm, I, I, I can do what he does, you know? So it's the chase, the thrill of the chase. Like, okay. It's all about the chase. Yeah, I it's love the chase. The chase. Yeah. It's like, okay. I always hit a certain goal. 
And then when I hit it, it's kind of sad as well because I don't ever feel satisfied. Then I set higher. Yeah. Yeah. Then I can only imagine it just, it never ends probably. Yeah. Maybe that's why we're in entrepreneurship. Absolutely. I'll ask your opinion on something actually based it. on this. Uh, a lot of seven figure, eight figure entrepreneurs, they have a controversial view of where they say, don't, I don't believe in saving. I never saved money in my life. I think even Lil Baby said in a tune, he was like, getting paid is the most I ever saved. Right. What what are your <laughs> what are yeah. your views on saving? Can you save yeah. yourself rich if you earn a good income or or not? Uh, question back at you. What are the savings for? I guess it's subjective, depending on who. Yeah. Who, who would be answering that? Yeah. I so so what do you need money for? Like just you, like personally. For me personally, similar to you in terms of looking after family. Yeah. Want to retire, mumsy, big yeah. goal of mine. Yeah. Financial freedom. Yeah. You know. But that isn't fun. what the savings is for. Like the savings is for like to pay those bills, isn't it? At the end of the month, and as entrepreneurs, we can always find income. Like, if your bills are gas, electricity, water, council tax, you, if you lose your car, it's not the end of the world. You get a new one when you come back up. Like, it's the essential bills that are not gonna affect your credit score. Essentially, <laughs> they're the bills that need to be paid, right? Yeah. So, what do you need savings for? Now, I'm not saying don't get savings, uh, but what do you need it for? Like, let's really understand what you really need your, your savings for. If I was to say maybe um, retirement, investments. No, we're too young, man. We're too young for that. So, so you can invest in investment vehicles. That's an investment. But a lot, of, a lot of the time, the investment vehicles are high capital. So the high capital means it depletes you so that you can't invest into the business, which needs to grow in order to make you more money. So I say have enough money to take care of the essential bills that are required for you to take care of for three to six months. Essential bills only. The other stuff is about just reinvesting to make more money so that you can get, savings not gonna retire, mom. Not gonna, you're gonna get 0.1% in the bank. It's not gonna help. Maybe investing in something will help cash flow to do something else. That's not gonna help retire mom either, mom and dad. So, um, so the, the, the question is, how do I feel about savings? My circumstances are very different because my missus is a saver and she makes a lot of money. So if anything goes wrong or like, it's cool. But also my living expenses are tiny and um, I'm so skilled in so many areas, I can generate revenue to cover those bills with ease. It, 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 we're now talking about, I have overheads and that's why my expenses are high. I've got staffing, I've got offices, I've got this, I've got that, blah, blah. If I had to cut that because I can't pay my bills and just cut it, right? So um, how do I feel about saving? I'm trying to give you an answer. Uh, hopefully, I know I've given a bit of a, uh, I think it's prudent to still be conscious about your bills and to survive. Saving can never be a bad thing, but shouldn't be the primary objective for young entrepreneurs. Uh, have your cushion should something go wrong. But man, look, when things go wrong, that's when we really come alive. That's when it's game time. Facts. Yeah, I've noticed yeah. I work so well yeah. under huge amounts of pressure. Yeah. Mm. It's probably not healthy. It's why my hair's receding. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, All of right, us are stressed, but... right? We're under the stress. Yeah. But that's when it's game time. That's when we pick up the phone. That's when we're really message calling people. Otherwise, we're just like, ah. we just, yeah, we, me the same. I'm the same. But when it's like, okay, cool. A project comes in on Friday and I've got to, I've got to have in place X amount of pounds to do this deal. <sighs> All those people who I've been meaning to call and contact, I'm on the phone. <laughs> Where are you? I'm coming to your office. You know, I'll, I'll come in and I'll go there if you, 11 p.m. You're getting to the airport. I'll meet you at the airport. Like, that's when it's game time. <laughs> Mate, it's so true. Me and Luke, we bought a program. It was kind of dodgy. We paid like 18, 20K for it. And it just ended up being really shit. I can't say who for legal reasons. <laughs> you're going after is, them for recovering your funds? Well, no, actually, back, yeah. we got a refund. Oh, cool. A refund on it, back, which yeah. I wasn't expecting. But when we did lose oh, you've that got money. got all of it back already. We got yeah, all of it back. Yeah. We funded every oh, single man. penny. Yeah, so it's it such a strong case. So they look.
Before keen to invest we into a, a program. <laughs> <laughs> before I knew we were getting a, a refund, I was hitting the phones like no time. I was calling prospects for a year ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Years ago. <laughs> I was like, damn. That's I need right. This energy. We need to lose money. money more, Luke. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> when you lose money, <laughs> you're money. like, I've got to replenish this. You've got to yeah. get it back, right? Yeah, that's right. that's yeah. when we go in the trenches. That's what entrepreneurship is about. And, and we operate the best under pressure, I think. For Definitely. Sure. Sub question to that as well. So, an entrepreneur in that 20s, maybe early 30s. <laughs> maybe 28. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Recently, I mean, maybe born in August. Might have just fallen down the wall. He always talks about himself. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. In, in, in well, third Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Star sign could be a Leo. <laughs> <laughs> um, would you advise someone who's building businesses to buy a house to live in yeah. or to rent? Oh, this is really, really interesting because this is like the gurus are saying, don't rent the house that you live in because it doesn't cash flow, right? This is a personal personal opinion, okay? Now, here's the thing. I have a family now. I've just had a, a baby boy, right? Congratulations. Congrats. Thank you so, so much. So is Harry. Harry's just had a baby boy. Congratulations, Harry. Um, now, I want stability for my family, which means I cannot get that fully having a landlord because he can sell at any time, he can throw me out, he can increase, whatever he wants to do, he can do. So for me, I like stability and I like consistency. So first of all, owning my home is important to me, okay? Now, I do accept it takes a large chunk of your capital. I get that. Now, I know where you, where you want to go with this. If you've got enough money to buy, buy. Right? If it's a, now your question may be about, should I buy my property or should I reinvest in my business? That maybe is a different question. But I always encourage people to buy their property. Do you know why? The property always goes up over time. Okay, you're always going, it's always going to be one of your best investments. And if I look back historically at the properties that I've owned and bought, they've always gone up. Even if I look at my homes that I've lived in, they've gone up 100K, 200K, 300K, right? Always. It's like my bank account. The more I pay into it, uh, the more I reduce my, my loan amount. It's just my bank account. Like, it's just my savings account that I can just overpay whenever I want. 10, you can pay overpay 10%, right? That's my particular lender. Uh, so it's like, uh, I would say if you've got enough disposable income to buy and it doesn't impact your, per, your, your business growth, then buy it all day long. Just on that, following up from yeah. that. And by the way, thank you. Yeah. That's helped me feel like I've answered some questions. Um, Oh my god, my mind's just gone blank. That's such a good question. Speaking about the house so you're gonna buy, isn't it? <laughs> no, no, it wasn't that. It wasn't that. It was um oh yeah, that's the question, Harry. Can you edit that bit out so it flows, please? Um, so with your revenue that you have coming into your bank account every single month, yeah. your wages, your dividends, what percentage is a healthy percentage to spend on your mortgage, in your opinion? Would you advise? I, I, I would say speak to a financial advisor about that. This, this is this is more, what can I afford every month consistently? What, I've, what have I been bringing in consistently every single month to myself? You don't want your mortgage to stress you out. You can see, I've got a friend that's got a beautiful place. His mortgage is like 12 grand a month. Wow. Right? Swimming pool, everything. Now look, this place is nice. But before you get out of bed in the month... You have to make sure you're making 12 grand plus council tax, plus gardener, plus swimming pool maintenance, all that stuff. Like I'm a banji. Like my my council tax is like just short of four grand, right? And you can only, you have to pay over 10 months, right? You can't even do 12 months, right? Like it's stress. I don't want to. So he's, he's 20 grand deep before he gets out of bed just for household expenses. That's... Stress for him, maybe it's not stress, but for me, that's stress. I don't want that. So I just think, look at look at what's convenient. Look at what makes sense. If two grand a month makes sense, you can find two bag a month, right? You can find that. Find three, maybe. I wouldn't portion it. Entrepreneurs is so different. This is not. I'm got my nine to five, and uh, I've got five grand in income each month. So sixty percent of that goes to my living. This is different. Our income goes all over the place. It's completely oh, different. Okay. This is what I always say to yeah. my girlfriend. I'm like, it's just, I 
can't plan the same way you can plan. Yeah. I might be making a hundred grand a month yeah. next year. I might be so it's impossible losing money. Now. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's like, and it could go either Something way. Goes wrong, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it's like. But I tell you what, if you buy that house, you refurb it, do your thing, you live in it comfortably. Our incomes go over the place. In three years' time, you're making way more than you are. You sell that house, and I, not guarantee, but pretty much, history shows us, property wins. So you're gonna make money on it. You get your capital out anyway. Mm. So that's why so I yeah. I've always been team buyer. We always have yeah. that debate between us. Yeah, I mean, this is this is people that have digested rich dad poor dad, and they've like you know they they live by it. That's the first book. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the first that's book that they've yeah. read, and like, no, I'm gonna rent the place that I live in, and I'm gonna uh, oh gosh, go away. Just leave so do you, do you still think property is a good investment? Because a lot again yeah. now you're kind of seeing. Um, whether you can invest in businesses or yeah. investing in property. Yeah. Which one would you choose out of the two? Yeah? Uh, business. Yeah, all day long. So would you, would you like buy businesses? And I've, I've read somewhere that you're involved in, I believe, well, I read two different ones, yeah. 20 or 13 different businesses. It's gone down which, significantly. So which one? Uh, uh, it's 13 okay. is probably more accurate. It's probably there or thereabouts. And these businesses uh, that you own or just that you're consulting for? So what, what's ended up happening in many st instances is I've mentored people who've got great businesses and great business ideas. And then I'm like, oh, I can add more value than you just speaking to me once a month or once a week. Let me invest or allocate my time to this business and I'll take a share. Um, and that's how I've acquired a variety of different businesses. And what do you... Is there any particular niche business that no, you look for? Just ones that like um, are easy for me to get customers for. So typically my audience is entrepreneurs. So if your clients need entrepreneurs, I'm just like, it's easy for me. I've got a whole army that know, like, and trust me already. So like, yeah, cool. I can just, you know. What are, what are some of those businesses that you're involved in then? Accountancy. Um, even recently, uh, like uh, protection, income and protection. So like they people that do life insurance, health insurance, all those types of things. So it just varies social media. Um, so a digital marketing agency very recently. Um, not fully, but they do various items on social media. So that's a couple of examples for you. Yeah. So How do people usually find you for mentorship? Like where do you get your social media? From? Oh, social media. Social yeah. media is massive for us. Word of mouth. They're probably our two main ones. And we've dabbled in some ads. Ads have been a gift and a curse. Um, but ads has been great. We've done six figures in a in a period in like maybe like six months worth of ads. Ads has been great. Ads were great for us 2021, 22, and then terrible for us late 22, 23, early 24. Uh, but we're going back. We just I just hired, hired an ad agency. We're going back in. Next What's month. the main product you're se selling then yourself? That will be the Speakers Academy. Yeah. Okay. Is that yeah. what else do you do around that in terms of your mentorship? So is that yeah? So the mentoring is uh, helping people start grow scale their business. So we now take on five people a month. Okay. Yeah, it's five people a month, and we help you whether it's your sales, whether it's your marketing, whatever it is. You know, my my, my expertise is sales and marketing. Um, and just getting the result. And then uh, Bianca is personal branding, sales, marketing, and she's a woman in business, so she relates to people in a slightly different way. We can communicate with you in slightly different ways. The way that I'll connect with you guys, different ways she'll connect with you guys. You know, I'll, I'll get results from you a different way than she would, perhaps. Um, and, you know, we've got retail experience. We've had products in QVC, Topshop, Selfridges. Um, so we've got retail experience. We've, we've authored three books. Uh, with the two largest publishers in the world, Penguin and Hasher. Uh, so like we've got all these experiences, we've done it. And everything that we do, we don't teach things we haven't done. Mm. So oh, what yeah. are these books in front of you here that you've bought? Yes, along? and my game as well. And so game. So um, first book is Self Made, which is uh, a book for entrepreneurs mm -hmm. who want to start, grow and scale their business. Um, that was our very first book. Um, read really 50,000 cool. copies? 50k and we've just got commissioned i just signed a contract for self-made too okay so uh, they want us to rewrite uh the book we're adding three chapters okay. it's going to be on i'm going to probably add probably a chapter on funnels and ai because that was these are all new things and because i've already taught those subjects i'm probably just going to transcribe the teaching uh and then rewrite it 
uh, for the book. So it's not that painful. So that's the first. What book. do you go into in the book? Like what? Yeah, take a look. So we we talk about here. Um, uh, first of all, like for example, like protecting your brand. So question for you all: Have you protected your name as a trademark? Have you protected your business as a trademark? No? Okay, cool. Maybe I'll trademark it today and sell it back to you in five years' time. <laughs> okay. I can't do your name because it's in bad faith, right? But still, these are the things that you need to start thinking about because someone will test you at some point. Have you protected, for example, .co.uk.uk.com? Have you done all three? So it's brand protection. Okay. So now you can't, you can't stop me from buying that. That's not in bad faith. So now I might just put something detrimental on there. Pornography, whatever it may be. Yeah. And now it, there's going to be reputational damage for you because your customer is not always going to put the right uh, uh, fix at the end. They might put .com or .uk or whatever it may be. But also when they're searching me, one of the things is going to come up may be that website. What impact is that going to have on your business? So like all these things, this is about building scalable businesses. You see how simple these things are that I'm talking about, right? But they just go over our head. And the only time we start to think about them is when it goes wrong. When you call me like Byron, this has just happened. Okay, cool. Now this is going to cost you for me to fix it X amount. Whereas to secure your brands is going to cost you, uh, your trademark is going to cost you £400. That lasts you 10 years. And the uh, secure, securing your, your website domains is 20 quid, 30 quid, right? So like now to fix it is a whole new world. Mm. Now you're negotiating with terrorists, right? Because literally they got you by the balls. Mm. So, uh, so yeah. how do um, I just see you've written it together, you and yeah. your partner? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Writ it, wrote yeah, it. wrote it together. Wrote yeah. it together. Bad English. Yeah. Um, how do you structure that? Is it like chapter at a time, or do you just? Yeah. So we go through the chapters and we say who's the best at which department, okay. and we say, okay, this is my expertise, this is your expertise, and then we basically spend one month writing that chapter, and then we have a writer that helps us transcribe it into our words into writing. Um, because also we have to make it bond into one voice so it looks coherent when you're as a reader. So that's how we've been writing our books. Um, so it probably takes eight months to write one book. We can do it quicker, but we've got a billion other projects going on. Um, but with that said, Self Made 2, I've got 30 days. Oh, wow. I've got 30 days to write this book. So I'll give you 30 days. No, but you. what happened was because we signed the contract and it took so long to do the co contract to come out and... Uh, the deadline, the publishing date is very fixed and I wasn't prepared to start writing until I got the contract. So I've got like 30 days and so I've got a trip to Mexico coming up. So 50,000 50, copies, is that through, what was your approach to, to get the book out there and to get those? Great question. Sales? So in the book, so I always say from a book, you should make six figures yeah? from your advance and from what I like to say is from your partnerships. So in that book, we've got RBS, Ulster Bank, um, Nat West, we've got an accountancy firm. Not an accountancy firm. That's the, that's this book. Uh, we've got a trademark company. We've got my solicitor. All, all, all relationships. They paid to be in the book. Okay, so these are partnerships. If I can put this in front of fifty thousand people, what's it worth to you? Right, it's worth ten k, twenty k. How much is your client? What's your average client worth? If twenty people buy your product, maybe more. What's it worth? So you, you package it and you sell it to, to the third party. You should be making six figures. Um, so we've, when it comes to books, I always say, like, to, well, to come back to your question, uh, how do we go about this? First of all, you pre-sell some of the books to your partners. So included in your package, you will get 100 books, 500 books, 1,000 books. Um, and then because we've got a great audience, a great community that goes to them, social media, it goes to them. You do the social, the press run because, of course, my business partner, Stroke Wife, she's done TV before. She's been on The Apprentice. It's like, um, it's easier to get press, for example, but there's still routes we can do to get to press. It's in the book as well. Uh, and then the second book, which was a Sunday Times bestseller, we did, don't quote me, but a couple of thousand units in the first it's like I think it's like a ten day period or something like that. So we did that was a Sunday Times bestseller. We're competing with the site the likes of like some of the OGs, Simon Scenic and all these OGs. We were cool. like I was like, Oh my god, That's we're so above we we're, we're above these guys. That's crazy. But they're but they're what they call category killers. These are like they'll never leave the, the top the top charts, right? Mm. Anyway, so um that was the second book. So the second, no, sorry, that's the third book. The second book was about the things they don't talk about in business, 
right? The stress, the anxiety, the rom- managing romantic relationships whilst in business, right? So like it would came out in COVID times. It's almost like you're already in business. Now this is the next level. Like talking about the things that they, we don't talk about in business essentially. Uh, and that was with Penguin. And then the third book was um, uh, is about money and finance. Um, because they don't talk about money. We don't get taught about money and finance. I don't know about you guys, but didn't teach me in, about money and finance in school. I learned about Pythagoras and <laughs> algebra, right? And Dave has four apples. Yeah. John three. Right? Yeah. At least that's semi-practical, right? <laughs> At least teaches how to count, pie. right? Pie. But um, but there was so, there's so many things as entrepreneurs and as business owners that we don't have in place that are essential. Um, this goes in this book. Like, and it teaches you about money, finance. It teaches you about protecting yourself. So, uh, for example, key man insurance. Y'all got key man insurance? If you go out, what happens? Even down to, like, protecting your assets. You know, like, for, for example, inheritance tax. Do you all have a trust? So if you haven't got a trust, you know, first of all, you know inheritance tax is a voluntary tax. No. I thought it was compulsory. <coughs> no. How do you get around that? There's not getting around it. It's a voluntary tax, Right. Not that there's no getting around it, but it's a voluntary tax, but you can protect your assets. So, for example, you, you're, the only people that it affects are the people that are not prepared. Mm. Right? You can move it out of your estate, can't you? Absolutely. All of the assets. Oh, that's what you mean by it's voluntary. If you yeah. Don't do if you don't put something in place... You have yeah. to do it if you... So it's mandatory, the normal, the but the government are entitled yeah. to this unless you do something about it. Okay, yeah. Right? That's insane. Imagine what assets you have right now. That's subject to inheritance tax. That's insane. We're in the process at the second of getting all this stuff set up. Yeah. Get it done. Structured. And even like, just like, you know, if you've got a family and stuff like that, like income protection or just like, we're all going to die. Are you protected? Like you might as well give your family a hundred, 500 grand. I'm insured for 500 grand. I hope they don't come for me. But you know, <laughs> something happens to me. It costs me 23 quid a month. We don't plan to die early, but anything can happen, right? Mm. So uh, these little things just about money and finance, like CCJs and uh, defaults and all these little bits and pieces and savings. I invested very early in national savings and investments. What that's about, like just everything about money and finance. In so this pra- sounds really practical. All real life yeah. stuff. And then the last one was the game. I was like, I'm tired of doing drinking games that just involve like scandalous stuff at Christmas. Like, yeah. It's fun as well, but like, come on. So I was like, I want to make own, my own game. So we made a game for entrepreneurs. So um, it's a card game for entrepreneurs. And it's you still can do your drinking while you're doing it, but it's more banned and it's competitive. Entrepreneurs, we're competitive. Yeah, we love that. Us for you. Is it, yeah. a four, is it a four we player have to play game? on the pod? Yeah, it's teams. <laughs> it's teams. teams. Yes. It needs at least three people. Oh, that's actually a great yeah. idea. Yeah. 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 Do it on the pod. Two v yeah, two. Do on it on the pod. pod. Yeah. I'll, yeah. Get you, I'll get you a copy sent. Yeah, nice. Yeah. How Absolutely. does the game work? Can you run us through it very briefly? So, in short, I'll give you a couple of cards so you can have a look at, right? And then you can read the question. You'll have a trial run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you'll read the question and then you'll is see. Is it on Amazon, by the way? Uh, so we can... It is not on Amazon. Amazon is a whole. Uh, of a ball game. A ball game. It was on Amazon. I should have it back in a month's time. Um, so I'll just pick in random, right? So so I don't make it. You look a magician now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just you know, just pass on a couple. Just yeah, pass on a couple, and read the question, and you can see. So we go on, yeah. So so in short, um, there is one person that will be telling what the question is, and then the two teams will pitch for it, and you'll decide who's the winner. So I'll short. decide. Yeah, so you can decide essentially. That's one way of playing it. The easiest way. So yeah. Okay, yeah, no, that makes sense. So I've got, I've got, okay, write, yeah, yeah. Write down your definition of crowdfunding, best description when it gives you the description underneath. Yeah, so we'll both write down the definition of crowdfunding, what that means, and then whoever wins, wins the points. And the first to 100K, so each card has a value. And the first uh, person yeah. to 100K. Uh, yeah. Oh, so you got, Come on that one. You got a gold one. Come on. Yeah. So some have 10K, some 10K. have 20K, some have 15K. So the first person, the first oh. person or team to 100K wins. That's yeah. cool. And, and it's quick. Like, and you say there's another way of playing it as well. Yeah, but that's the easiest way. Yeah. Like, it's just the easiest way, yeah. That's pretty cool. 
To be fair, when did you, you launch you this? Can read the questions, Harry. And yeah, it's cool. three people. Yeah. It's good. It's good, it's good even with guests. The other way, so the other right. way to play it essentially is you can move who the move who is the adjudicator. So uh, if there's three of you, you can start with the first question. You can move the, and then you move round. But I don't like playing it that way. Yeah, everyone's. When did you own. launch this? this? Cool. Like it. Uh, it came out back in the last year, and um, we had our launch in December. Um, so Success. Yeah. Um, I would say no, um, because I've not allocated any time to it. Like my, the Amazon went down, and I've and only literally this week I decided to look at it. <laughs> but so it's just not a priority. Um, people that are within my network are buying it, and I've not looked into getting into retail yet. But now I've got more time on my hands. I'll have this in retail. Hold me to this within three months. Like now, I've got more time on my hands. Need it in time for Christmas. Well, basically, I had a baby. Yeah. Uh, so I, my, good excuse. I was like, my time was just not my own. Yeah. Um, baby came in March. We're in what now September. So I've just like loads of things that just weren't a priority just went on the back burner. But I have this in retail in three months. Nice. Yeah. Let's talk about the UK. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. The UK has always been a great place to do business, depending on who you ask. I personally think it has Absolutely, been. I agree. However, now there's other places emerging, right? You've yeah. got Dubai, you've got Texas, yeah. you've got Lisbon. Yeah. Is the UK done out here? It's done. Sinking ship. Decide when you're going to jump off. Why you have you not moved? Do you think it's ever going to recover? Or do you think it's going to gradually go down? It's a sinking ship. The UK is a sinking ship. I'm really sorry. I've lived here my whole life. I love the UK. Um, pay my taxes. You might just need to mind the mic back. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it, the UK is a sinking ship. It, it doesn't promote the things that we want in life. So you say, okay, you say, okay, let's have the let's have the open conversation then. What makes the Great Britain great now? It used to be like we had exceptional healthcare, right? Now the healthcare is free. We can just say it's free, but it's not exceptional anymore. Really, wait times are crazy. Like, yeah, the staff might be great, so respect to all those that are in that healthcare profession. But would you say it's exceptional healthcare? No. No? That's no, far from it. Yeah. You've got to wait <coughs> months for an appointment. Right. So, so like, right, isn't it? so like when, I'm in, when I'm in the UAE, so I have international medical care. It's expensive, but it means that when I'm here, I can, I got, it's so different. Even being here, the rules behind my medical care is different to when I'm in Dubai. In Dubai, choose any medical place, go and get your treatment, and they'll just pay for it. But even like I was sick one day, I called the doctor. He was with me in 20 minutes. He wrote me a prescription, took a photo, sent that to the pharmacy. The pharmacy brought the um, uh, prescription to my apartment. You have to pay for it still. But look at the convenience. That's insane. Mm. Like what? Like if you're sick in the UK, you you, you, you have to suffer. right? <laughs> you have to find a pharmacy. You're going to have to sit down with everybody else that's sick. Like it's long. So, okay, to come back to the question. The UK, why well, I think it's sinking ship. Uh, they're not promoting the people that are bringing money into the economy. They want to spank everybody for taxes. So all the rich people are leaving because they don't want to pay the taxes, right? So that's not helping the economy. Percentage-wise, most in the world last year. Is that right? That are leaving? Percentage-wise, millionaires. That are leaving. So I think we that's gained that's that. I think right. in, yeah, like, so there's a, there's a, there's a, a heat map essentially that shows yeah. millionaires that have come in or out of the country yeah. left yeah. Uh, within last year. And we was like minus 9,000, 9, yeah. something rather. Yeah. The only country that was more was China, which was 15,000. Yeah. But wow. the comparison yeah, yeah. of per person. Per, per person, percentage wise, yeah. we're by far. And, and yeah. the biggest heat map, green, was UAE. Of course. Naturally. Think about America this. was still in the positive, just. Say, let's move to safety. How safe are you? I mean, if you want to wear a nice watch in London, you might get your, hand you might chopped get your off. arm chopped off, right? Facts. And now they're not even trying to fight you. People say, I'm a tough guy, I'll fight. They're not, they're not trying to fight you. They'll smash you on your head from yeah. behind, and you're out. And then they'll go and take your watch. And not even give you a chance to just hand it over yeah. half the time. That's Look, just ask a, me, I'll take it off. Yeah, exactly. I'll say, mate, you forgot something. Uh, I'm good. You don't even have to ask me aggressively. You can have it. I'm not trying to fight. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to risk my life. So in the UK, there's no safety. My car got stolen from my driveway. Yeah. My rolls got stolen from my driveway. 
the roller right. as well. Not yeah. the roller, man. Happens every day, oh. right there, Andy, though. It's every normal. single day. It is normal. Yeah. 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 I rang the police. They go, oh, well, we're not going to bother to come because, you know, there's no car there. Yeah. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> right? Just rubbing it in. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. And, and response? It's a bit of a movie no, how I got true. the car back, but I won't talk about that right now. Uh. Uh, this is the first time publicly I'm actually speaking about it. I've never spoke about it before. Um, but they got a car back the next day uh, and there was someone in the car and they released them with no further action. Explain that, please. Did you what, get the car back? Got the car back. And the guy got caught who stole the car? Mm, there was a woman in the car. Bloody that's yeah. weird. That's crazy, right? No, it really is. And that's the, that's the extent of... I've got nothing, I'm not trying to dig out anyone like policing and stuff. Crime is high and they don't have the resources to, to deal with these things, right? And a Range Rover have put, deployed millions to help the police and all these kinds of things, right? Because they're effective. But ultimately, so we're coming back to the point safety. Are we safe? No. Like when I'm in the UAE, I leave my phone and I leave my laptop here and I'm working in a public place. I go to the bathroom. And I come back and I don't even think about it. And you know when you trans trans go between the two, transition between the two, and you come back to the UK, I forget sometimes, and I remember myself like, oh, can't do that here. Literally, I remember when I <coughs> got to the airport, I'd have like my pouch on yeah. around the back of me, and literally, I just remember just naturally doing it when I got, was coming out, just spinning my pouch round yep. from back to front. Yep. That's just like the natural instinct that when you're here, you just... It's different. It's a different world. Different. You've just landed. It's like, yeah. fuck, better put this... Different world. George from Seven Days, um, the raffle company, prize company, he left in... Dubai left his Lamborghini keys on the top of his car or by accident or on the seat or something for like hours. And like, oh, that's normal. Yeah, so like if like you're getting a car or if I'm hiring a car or a hire car, when I'm returning it and stuff, I just leave the key, leave the car open and leave the key on the chair. Even sometimes I've done that at the airport. Told them where it is. Take a photo. You send everything via WhatsApp. Every business is on WhatsApp. Mm. Send it, and they just come and collect it. And they're not stressing you out. Oh, we haven't paid because they know you're going to pay. It's not stress, mm. right? Even if you look at this, like just let's just use your own property, right? So let's just use this as an example. How do squatters have rights? Mm. Yeah, I've never like, understood. That. Make this make sense. <laughs> you're living in my house <laughs> that I am paying a mortgage for. You basically do not want to pay. How do you have rights to live here? And it's not be ki- and I, ha- I have to go to court and follow a process to get you out. And you know the system so better than I that you can actually ruin me, right? Mm. How does that make sense, right? And whereas the UAE, listen, if you owe me money, I go to the police. You get arrested. You go to jail. Mm. You send me a bounce check. You're going to jail, mate. <laughs> like it's that's how nice. we should be doing business. It is, yeah. I don't know so why aren't you living out there, baby? So I was living out there for the last since COVID, uh, and I recognised that, like my family, my missus, we don't have the support system and we don't have the infrastructure yet in Dubai. So I haven't bought somewhere in Dubai yet. So it, our home is not home. So we don't have all of the, you know, the little things, you know, your juicer, your, t- the, you know, the little things that just make your home your home. Uh, we didn't have that set up, so. Um, when we were having the baby I, and I recognised she doesn't have like the friendship group out there. So I was like, it's important for us to come back to have the baby. Uh, and also you're looking at costs and stuff like that. For baby, you know, we went private in the end, which was an absolutely incredible experience, by the way. If anyone's thinking about doing it or can afford to do it, oh, go private. Um, and uh, I just didn't have the infrastructure for my wife to be happy and I knew that because I can live anywhere got the friends boys you know we're out we're doing our thing it's different for women I feel like and they bond differently with people so she, we just didn't have that support system her mom and stuff like that so mm-hmm. we came back in January uh, and I'm just now just saying okay we're gonna give it 18 months before I make another decision let's see how it is with the baby and figuring it out so that's why that's the only reason I'm back Fair enough. How yeah. do you like manage your sort of lifestyle with your wife? You're in business together. Yeah, live together, work you, together. You together. Yeah. So how how the, how's the dynamic of that? Yeah, work? it works really well actually. Um, now it's a bit ch- it's changing. It still works well. It's changing how it works, but she's an entrepreneur. She's a go getter. She executes very very well. So she's cool. Um, uh, and like I know people always ask what's it like do you argue do you have like you know 
I'm very like a, probably an annoying bleep whereby like if I've got a problem with you but we're doing business, it's just separate. So I'm just separate with it. Like we might have a dis- disagreement or, or whatever in the evening. Babe, uh, yeah, can you send me th- like... I was still asking a very normal and polite. I'll even, but also I forget we even had a problem, so it's also a problem. But um, <laughs> it's also it just works. It works, and um, we're responsible for different things. So now she works within the business only a very tiny amount, uh, like five percent of her time. Um, How long have you been together for? Sixteen years. Oh wow, long yeah. time. Sixteen years, married six, seven years. Yeah. What year was she on the Apprentice? Two thousand twelve. A finalist yeah. Finalist Yeah She was a finalist Pitched a brand of Hosiery Nude hosiery Yeah uh, Came second to a very worthy winner um, Who was the winner that time? His name was Mark He was a oh, right. Mark Climb Ryan. Online yeah. He runs Climb Online, Climb Online. Marketing yeah. agency That's right yeah, yeah Yeah So it's easy to scale right? Easy to scale business If I was Store Sugar I would have done the same thing It's an easy to scale If she would have won If it would have, wasn't for that year because he was one of the top five of all time candidates, I believe, and equally her as well, top five all time candidates. But she was just in the same year as him, and he was a worthy winner because he had a great, great, great. Did great she have business scalable. before she went on that? Uh, no, no. So that would have been uh, there. Would have been the first. We've been together for a couple of years. Yeah, before. we were together, and um, well, she had a business. So, so she worked for a recruitment company. She worked for a, a marketing aid. A, Marketing agency, a consultancy company, massive one in the UK, uh, Accenture. Maybe, you may be familiar with it. Um, and then she was like, went to recruitment, and then she was like, I hate this job. And she was like, B, I want to leave and like start my own business. And I was like, Cool, what do you need? She was like, I need this amount of money. And I was like, Cool, yeah, just rang two of my mates, and then I put some money in. So the three of us put money into her business. We were all shareholders. So I want my shares. I will give my share certificate. It's business, right? Yeah. Clarity. So I invested in her business. She left. And then her first client was HSBC. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. Her first client. And then she's grown that business. And, I, you know, we get our dividends every year. That's so that's good to get still, 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 still going. ongoing. Yeah, still going. She's tried to buy back our shares from all of us. <laughs> buy back our shares. And she's, we're not having it. <laughs> what do you and your wife do for fun outside of business? What's your escape? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what? We... um. It's changing now. This is such a weird, like, because it's like real time having a baby. So, like, the fun changed a little bit now. So, like, so maybe I have to give you two answers. Yesterday, I went swimming with the baby. I really enjoyed it. It's so weird, right? Like, saying it because it's like so different to where I was before. Um, so, we, so historically, let's say pre March, we lived like rock stars. We traveled the world together. We're traveling three to five times a year together and we're doing all the things that everybody does. Beach clubs, parties, great dinners, great experiences. So we're doing that. Um, we also like to, we also do that here in the UK without the, the sun and the beach. So we just do the things that everybody does essentially for fun. Um, uh, I've been a member of a private members club now uh, for the last 12 years. Yeah, 13 years Where's when that? I sold my first company. It's called Home House. Oh, yeah. I have a members club in Portman Square in Mayfair, Merrily Bone. Yeah. Um, so I joined there when I sold my first company. And um, essentially what I wanted to do was um, some of my friends were not able to do some of the things that I wanted to do. When I kind of sold that business, I didn't have. They, I wanted to travel. Like, let's go next week. They weren't entrepreneurs. Like, let's go be from this closing parties. Let's go. Like, <laughs> let's do stuff. And like, let's go for dinner. I didn't want to argue about who had the still water and sparkling water. Like, <laughs> so I wanted to just do different things. And you do different things with different people, respectfully. And it's like, um, so I joined the members club, and within like two months, I went on a car rally from London to Ibiza, London, Paris, Valencia, Denia, Barcelona, Ibiza. Wicked. Some things I cannot talk about, but it was a <laughs> great trip. But you meet people, you spend the whole week with them. Suit hundred supercars. Was it Cannon Run or Gumball Rally or something? Like no, that? this one was called Modball. Oh, Modball, yeah, yeah, yeah. Modball. I don't know if it's still around. It is. Yeah, yeah. It's massive. It was. It was 
It's great. Great trip. That was just with people from the, the club. Just one guy, oh, essentially. One and then he introduced me to other people. And then you network. You're with people for every day. Mm. For lunch, yeah. dinner. So you meet cool people. So some people I still speak to to this day. Um, so that's as a result from the club and friendship groups, opportunities. You do business together. Um, and it's kind of sets like a benchmark of entry, right? So member club has always been a good thing for me, yeah. We're a member of uh, Founders Club. Oh, yeah, cool. How is it? Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah really good. Yeah. Good. Oh, you're yeah. creatives as well, so like... Yeah, no, it's cool. Yeah. I've looked at the home... Home house. Home house. Yeah. Homegrown. Homegrown, yeah. I wouldn't go homegrown, um, respectfully. To, but home house is better, I would say. And arts club is interesting. Okay. I've heard that, yeah. Arts club's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it's good. It's just getting the time to go to them all. When you got... Do you know what? Just work from there. Or I, I use it in the evenings. I probably don't use it the way it's supposed to be used. So I use it in the evenings. Um, yeah, that's my... Because I don't want to go to a club in the UK. Like, mm -hmm. going to a club is a bit different. It's not like Dubai. It's not go yeah, back yeah, there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so, uh, so that's my that's my party vibe. I'm very creature of habit. I, I have the same table in the same corner of the club. They have a club in the, in the, in the members oh, club. Oh, do they? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. One uh, one last question Tell for me. you. Yeah. Um see, on your like Instagram profile, there's yeah. no like businesses tags or anything like that, but I did notice your doctor. Yeah. Oh, good called. question. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Where's uh, the doctor come from? So I have been doing a lot of work with um charities, philanthropy, and of course helping entrepreneurs become financially free, change many, many, many people's lives. And um, I did a lot of work with my university of Greenwich, helping them uh, in a, a variety of different ways. I don't want to be humble bragging right now, but I've helped them in a variety of different ways. That's created lots of ecosystems for the university and for entrepreneurs. Uh, and they afforded me the accolade of an honorary doctorate. Um, last year, the year before last, last year, oh my God, time's flying. No, year before last, I think it was. Uh, so I was given an honorary doctorate for my services to entrepreneurship and philanthropy. Uh, and I think I was one of the youngest to receive it. And if you look at it, they probably give like five people or so, don't quote me, but a handful of people every year is kind of honorary. Usually you're really old mm -hmm. when you normally get this. Got like some stripes. Yeah, you got your stripes. Um, so I think I brought a bit of youth to it as well So that was what my doctorate was for My honorary doctorate was for uh, And I always say there's some people have a problem with that as well Like there was a couple of people Ironically, I'll talk about this in a minute But um, uh, there are different ways to achieve the goal Right So some one way is to study and One way is to be honoured for it mm -hmm. Right There's the two routes You chose one route I still went to university, I remember, and gave them my money, um, and they gave me the doctorate. So I loved that. And the, the person, there was somebody that was actually really upset with me because they studied for their doctorate, you know, they studied, they grafted for it. And they sent me a DM. I, I put it on my Instagram, actually. <laughs> you know, it's something about this really, up, you know, it doesn't sit well, with, sit well with me that you got an honorary doctorate. She's a doctor by, she already has her doctorate. Irony is, last year, my university... Gave her an honorary doctorate and she accepted it. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> she said yes. <laughs> so how ironic is that, <laughs> right? Comes full circle. <laughs> and I was going to post about it, but I said, you know what? It's it, the internet moment. beef. Yeah, yeah. yeah it is, the moment's gone. Did you, you, know? did you message her saying congratulations? Yeah, <laughs> I think I blocked her. Oh, I think I blocked her. That would have been like, enough, really. And, and the person I yeah. oh, so give context. She, it's not like a stranger, not an internet stranger. I know her. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's not like I don't know you. I know you. Have, we've done stuff together. So it's fine. So that's how I got my doctorate. So the last one on my, uh, my I think the only, the only two things. So I used to write for Forbes. I've been Forbes featured. So I did that for nine months. And just respectfully to Forbes. It just doesn't pay well enough and takes too much time. And I can't write about everyone I want to write about. There's too many restrictions. So I know as of maybe January, I stopped December, January, I stopped writing for Forbes. Um, and then um, uh, there was something else. So the only two accolades are that I want that I think I one is I think I want one is I definitely want. Uh, it's now on my agenda to do a TEDx. So it, when I say it's on my agenda, I don't know if I want it. So basically, I, I think.
think that's the NDC thing. So I've started going through the process. Bianca will have a tear in the next three months. I've started working on it. It'll be done. And then that'll mean that open the door for me as well and whatever. But her first and then I'll think about doing it after. But so TEDx and then uh, MBE. They're the only two things that I think have any credibility to like me as a brand. They're the How only do you get things. the MBE? Services to business, entrepreneurship, philanthropy, uh, helping people do achieve things. I think I'll get that. Yeah. You're doing all that now, right? But yeah, I suppose yeah. you have to get recognised. Yeah, it's, for it's, it. it's on well, a bigger scale. You know, I've done charitable works. I've worked with homeless charities, done some incredible things for them. I've been chair of that charity. I've been chairs of universities. I've done work with schools and so on. So, so I think like that is the only two credibility pieces that is achievable bar anything that I just need to tick off. Yeah, I, I think within 18 months, 24 months, I'll tick them off. Nice. They'll be done. Good. So for the listeners, where can they find you? What's your socials? Yeah, so at Mr B Selfmade, uh, connect with me there on uh, Instagram, and then LinkedIn. Um, just type in Byron Cole and connect with me on LinkedIn, whatever your. And you can find me on other places and spaces, but they're the ones that I use, and my team, I guess, just copy content over. Nice. Yeah. Appreciate you coming on. Thank, Thank you for you having me. Much. Thank you for having yeah, me. Awesome. It. Thank, Thank you. <laughs>